all praise God. Can somebody say, Jesus is Lord. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Isn't it good to be alive in the family of God? Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank God for all that he is and all that he does. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, God's at work in the earth. There's great things happening. By next year, we'll have over 110 Raymond Bible Training Centers in 38 countries around the world. Praise God. God's at work. We, have, we had at least a thousand men at the men's conference. And uh, so we're going to look into next year uh, getting a group of women who want to go to the women's conference. I mean, get together and drive, you know, rent a big van and ride out or whatever. And then the men's conference, the same thing. And um, let y'all know far enough advance so you can get your ho get a money, save up some money, go to the hotels, save some money, to go to the conference. There, there are Thursday, Friday, and Saturday morning meeting, <coughs> so you could actually leave on a Wednesday. So you only, you know, if you want to take three days of vacation or whatever, there you go. Um, you could get out there on that and um, come back over the weekend, get out on Saturday, drive all night, get back in time for church on Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. But I tell you, it was, I know the men's conference was awesome. Um, hallelujah. Good speakers. And next year is going to be good. Even got this really cool uh, uh, backpack kind of deal. Praise God. Amen. And um, it's just God is good. Amen. Yeah. Open your Bibles, if you will, to the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. Now to recap, we've been teaching for a few weeks on, on the, the uh, book of Ephesians using uh, th this basic uh, synopsis that the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians deals with what has been done for us in Christ. And this is the grace of God. It's the Godward side. Hallelujah. <clears throat> it's what's been done. If you just read Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, you can get a skewed perspective of what grace is all about. Amen. If you just read what he's done for you and start running around going, oh, it's, done, it's all been done for me, it's all been done for me, it's all been done for me. And don't read the rest of it, you'll get a skewed, you'll get a skewed view. Because Paul comes right back in the final three chapters and, and tells us what we are to do. Amen. Because of what's been done. Amen. And this comes up to that, that word, four-letter word in the plural. <laughs> that four-letter cuss word to some people. Works. Works. Well, Ephesians chapter 2 says we're created in Christ Jesus unto good. What? Works. Amen. And so, we, because, because of what Christ has done for us, does not absolve us from doing. Everybody say amen. So we, we find out that there is a Godward side to things and there is a manward side to things. God has given his grace freely. And, remember, and, and in this we've talked about the fact that the definition of grace is broader, is much broader than just undeserved, unmerited favor. Everybody likes to use that definition. That's kind of become the pat definition of grace. But even if you'll go back and study Septuagint use of the, uh, uh, of the word charis and the Hebrew words it translated, it's not just limited to unmerited favor. Okay? And as you'll study how Paul used the word, he, he elevated it from just the, the place of favor and gift and to even coming to a place that it, it represents empowerment, divine empowerment. Amen? Serving grace, ministry grace. You can't put serving grace, God's undeserved unmerited favor, unto grace that causes you to serve. No, you're empowered to serve. You're empowered to minister. Amen? And so it empowers us to do good works, which is the manward side. Now, um, we get down to Ephesians 6, 10. Paul's taking first you know, chapter 4, all the way through chapter 6, verse 9, talking about what we're to do, what we're to do, what we're to do. If he comes down to 6, 10 and tells, starts telling us how. Amen? It's, not, it's, not, it, it's been done for us by grace. Because of the grace and the empowerment of grace, we are to do. But you know what? It's not good enough until he comes along and tells you how. Amen? It's more than just it's been done for you by grace and you're supposed to go do something. How do I do it? How do I do what he told me to do because of what's been done? Well, he starts out with this verse here in, six, in, in 610. Uh, <clears throat> and he says this, finally, my brethren, or in conclusion, my brethren, su summarizing all of this, 
Paul comes up and goes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. When we're saying do things, we're never talking about doing it in your strength. We're never talking about doing the works of the law. We're not talking about your ability and your, your power and how great you are. We're talking about something where God's grace has empowered you to do, and here's how you do it. Finally, my brethren, summarizing all of this, be strong in the Lord. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. <clears throat> we are to do in the power of God. You can't do it all in your strength. Your willpower is not enough. If your willpower was not enough, I mean, if your willpower was enough, you wouldn't have gotten the fix you were in in the first place. Because nobody wants to be defeated. Okay, one person said, Amen. Have it, do the rest of y'all want to be defeated? <laughs> I said, nobody wants to be defeated. Yeah. I got about 40% of you. I said, nobody wants to be defeated. Yeah. Thank you for those uh, hearty, unrequested amens. Yeah. Non-manipulated. <laughs> Amen. Non-coerced. Amens. No one wants to be defeated. Everybody wants to live in victory. And Paul comes along after saying, telling us how the grace of God has been laid out and how the grace of God has been imparted to us and what Jesus did for us. <clears throat> and then he comes back in verse, chapter 4 starts telling us because of that we're supposed to walk worthy of the vocation. We're to do this and we're not to do that and we're to live this way. And, we're and, then, he, and then after he says all that, I know some people's heads got to be spinning. Oh man, how can I do all that? And he says, finally my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There is a strength that comes from God you're not going to find anywhere else. You're not going to find it in a liquor bottle. You're not going to find it with a needle. You're not going to find it in someone from the opposite sex. You're not going to find it in, a, in, in, in drinking a 16-ounce uh, Mountain Dew with a can of Red Bull. You're not going to find the might or the strength or the power in any of those places. There is a place that strength comes from, hallelujah, that infuses your entire being. Glory to God. It's called the power of God. John said a greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. There is a strength that comes out of our relationship with God. <clears throat> Paul says lean to that strength. Learn to trust the power of his might. His miracle working ability. His infusing power. That when there is no ounce of physical strength left in you, when there is no more desire in you, when there is no more left in you that you can, that you can stir up, there is one on the inside, hallelujah, full of power, full of might, glory to God, that if you will learn to lean on him, and trust in him, he will rise up. Amen. Hallelujah. He will rise up and put you over the top. Hallelujah. Oh my. I'm so glad I don't have to do it by myself. Oh my. I'm, so, I'm glad I don't have to do it by myself. <laughs> you do it by yourself, you get in trouble. Because you're, you're a mess going somewhere to happen by yourself. Amen. Are you here? It's you and Jesus. It's his might. And Paul, and Paul says, so he makes this transition out of, out of doing into how by saying look to the might, look to the strength, look to the power of the one in you. Hallelujah. So that you're not doing this by yourself. You're not left you're not left to your devices. You're not left to your strategies. You're not left to figuring out, how can I get this done? You've been called into a relationship with the creator of the universe, 
the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, he who was and what, who is and was and is to come, glory to God, the one that has the keys of death and hell, glory to God, the one that strips Satan of his authority over man, glory to God, hallelujah, he is the greater one that's on the inside this morning, praise God, and Paul says, look to him, amen. Glory to God. To get the job done. Can you say amen, somebody? Amen. And so he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Then he goes to verse 11 and says, put on the whole armor of God. Hallelujah. He didn't say take a sleeping pill and take a wake up pill and, you know, take some kind of uh, energy drink. You know, to be honest with you, listen, I don't know if you kids have been doing energy drinks. Energy drinks and caffeinated drinks have killed people. The combination of the two are very dangerous. Don't ever do that. It's not, well, I did it and I got away with it. It's not the did it and got away with it. It's the did it you didn't. They're not good for you. Trust the Lord. Trust the strength of God. Amen. But listen, he says, put on the whole armor of God. He didn't say put on all your human reasonings. Now, you understand, that, remember, even in the Godward side and the manward side, we don't depend on all the human accolades and the human abilities and the human mind to get it. God gives us wisdom. God gives us understanding. God strengthens us. <laughs> Amen? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Understand, Satan sets strategies against you. Satan has plans to defeat you. Satan wants to take you out. Y'all hear you gone home. He wants to kill you. He wants to defeat you. He wants you to go bankrupt. He wants you to lose everything. He wants to make you a mockery. And to that, we need to come to the place where we can stand up, bow our backs, get our heads up tall, stick out our chest, and say, bring it on. Not because you're somebody, but because of, because of who you're in, you're somebody. He says, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against all those strategies, all those events, all those things Satan's been trying to plan to, un to cut your feet out from under you, to defeat you, to bring you down. Listen to this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know that person that, that just peeves you? That you can't stand to see the sight of them? That wasn't them. That was the devil working through them. And you've got to learn to recognize what you're dealing with. You ain't dealing with them. You're dealing with the devil working through them. Your battle's not with them in the flesh. Your battle's with the spirit operating in them. Jesus said he was going to go die. And Peter said, not so, Lord. And Jesus turned around and said, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't talking to Peter. <coughs> he wasn't calling Peter Satan. He was talking to the spirit that was influencing him at the time. But you see, we get real, we get, we get so caught up with personality and things and, and we begin to battle from that, that realm that we begin to think it's the person and we don't recognize the spirit at work in the person. Okay, I got a, a one that's right. Amen. For we wrestle not... Your battle's never with them against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Look over in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 10. <clears throat> we'll, we'll read verse 1. He says, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who, who uh, in presence and base among you, but being absent and bold toward you, I, and I, but I beseech you that I may not be, that I may not be bold when I am present with, with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Don't you just love the way Paul just double talked there. 
He's back saying, usually when I'm with you, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of mild, but now that I'm writing this letter to you, I'm being bold. And let me tell you, I hope it works because when I get there, I'm going to be bold. Okay? I don't want to show up and have to be bold with you in the flesh. Okay? Because some of you think we walk according to the flesh. Buddy, we walk in the spirit. And there's a difference against spir of, of spiritual authority and natural authority. Amen? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, we're in a human body, buddy. We, we don't do our battles that way. We do them in the spirit. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not natural. <clears throat> but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that he is, as he is Christ, so are we Christ. Then Paul begins to go into his boasting. <laughs> we don't get into that. But our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're what? Mighty through God to the pulley down of strongholds. This does not mean go rent a helicopter and fly around Greensboro and fight devils up in the atmosphere. People did that about 15 years ago. They were renting the top floor of the skyscrapers. They were renting helicopters flying around the city, you know. And all, all I could think all that time was poor Jesus just had to stand on the ground and get the job done. He, he didn't know he had to get up in a helicopter. We don't see him elevating up, you know, above the cities in, in, in his glory. Like when he walked on the water, we don't see him elevating up in the atmosphere and fighting devils. Man, they came to him right there on the ground. Amen. We, we, our, our battle is against spiritual forces. And we do battle in the spirit. You don't have to have a helicopter to do battle in the spirit. Y'all hear you go home. I said, y'all hear you go home. You don't have to get in a helicopter and fly around to do battle in the spirit. You go back and look at Daniel and he began to fast and pray. And there was battle going on, but he never left the planet. Now, last night, we were flying 37,000 feet, and I didn't feel any more spiritually uh, empowered than I do right now on the ground. Hello? Hello. Actually, I felt a little less. I was cramped. <laughs> it stuck us in that little jet. Hallelujah. We wrestle not. Everybody say, wrestle not against flesh and blood. I'll tell you, it's important you get that. You ever had, anybody ever had somebody just get under your skin? Frankie Valley did. I got you under my skin again. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of y'all remember that song. How many remember that song? One, two, three, four, five, six. Nathan didn't remember. He, he learned it new because we taught him about it. He raised his hand. I remember that song. No, well, <laughs> yeah. Originally. <laughs> you know, how, but how many people ever get some person that gets under your skin? Raise your hand. All right. Yeah. Now, there are going to be people that get under your skin. But let me say this. They're not the problem. It's the Spirit working in and through them. It's the Spirit behind that that you're going to have to deal with. Because you'll, you'll never get victory dealing with the flesh. That spirit will just laugh at you. Oh, he'll just make, he'll mock you. You, he'll me, hey, you idiot, you, you're fighting the wrong battle. It's like one person said, you know, uh, unforgiveness is like drinking poison waiting for the other person to die. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't forgive you. You poison now die. <laughs> Remember, it's kind of like Princess Bride. The Sicilian. Remember? Uh, anyway. I'm smarter than you. Boom. Yeah, anyway. We wrestle not. So get that, people. Get it that it's not so-and-so. It's not sister so-and-so. It's not brother so-and-so. It's not this person. They're not the one that you, It's the spirit and operation behind them. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But we do wrestle. 
the, the inference there is, but we do wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. <clears throat> there are spiritual forces at work that we do wrestle against. But Paul has already said in 2 Corinthians that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You're not, listen, I remember, oh, I guess now it's about, well, it's about just about the same time of the helicopter thing. It was the same bunch, actually. The army of God, helicopters, skyscrapers, and warring tongues. They get in there and they scream till they were hoarse in tongues at the devil. They'd us all get together and scream and scream and scream and say they were doing warfare against the devil. Of course, they call it spirit. Listen, you can fight the devil under your breath. Hello? You can sit there in the middle of the situation and say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I take authority over you, you spirit. You stop functioning, operating here. You don't have to get up in the middle of a crowd of people and go, I bind you, devil, in Jesus' name. Hello? Amen. You don't have to. I mean, that's, that's, listen, if you're, if you're in your own private place and you want to scream and, 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 I mean, bounce like on a pogo stick, that's, but see, there's some places it's not the proper place to do it that way. And what do you do? Well, you don't have to get all crazy to beat the devil. Usually that's for you, not for the devil. The devil's not impressed with how wild you were. It's how much authority is behind what you say. In, in, in the kingdom of Israel, when people walked in, the king didn't have to say, you walked in and announced, die. He either raised or lowered his scepter. He, that's all he did. The authority behind that determined if they lived or died. It's that simple. It's the authority behind it. If you understand your authority in Christ, if you understand who you are in Christ, if you understand the authority of the name of Jesus, then when you do battle, you can do battle by authority. That's why your weapons aren't carnal. They're not of the flesh. They're not a fleshly means. They're of the Spirit, glory to God. And remember, you're under the grace of God. God's done his side. He's commanding you to do what he says to do. And now his power is working in you. His authority is working in you. His exousia has been granted unto you, the authority. Remember, there's different words for power. Um, one is exousia, which is authority. Then there's dunamis, miracle working power. And then you get into the different words for might and, 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 and uh, those kind of things. Mighty workings, there's different Greek words for those. But, you know, for the word power, there's exousia and there's, a, then there's dunamis. Exousia is, is, is in reference to authority. Number one, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against those different things. But remember, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't do it in a fleshly way. We do it standing from the position of the authority of the believer that we're in Christ Jesus. And because of that, everything we say according to the Word of God, what we speak, what we declare, has all the heaven's power, heaven's dunamis behind it. Glory to God. I said glory to God. <clears throat> we all know this. The difference between exorcism and dunamis is this. A police officer might walk out, I mean, uh, a police officer might walk out there in the middle of the street and hold his hand up and tell everything on that interstate to stop. I command you to stop in the name of the law. He's got the authority. He doesn't have the power to stop those cars. But let one truck run over him and see what happens. A whole bunch of dunamis will show up on the truck that ran over him. They'll be out with every, I mean, every kind of weapon, helicopters, tractor trailer police rigs, I mean, whatever they takes to bring him down. Wow, because all the dunamis of the law stood behind the, the exousia of that stop. And you may not physically be able to stop devils and stop principalities and stop powers, but I can tell you something. That when you speak the name of Jesus, all of heaven's dunamis stands behind it. And there are dudes there that can whoop some principalities and powers and mights and dominions and rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places. As a matter of fact, <coughs> the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords has already cleaned house one time. Got an email last night from um, 
I, I believe it was from Dean Berg. And, and, and somewhere in some city, um, this guy went into a store and robbed it. And on the way out, he ran into four Marines. Well, he, he was able to actually stab one of the Marines in the back. And, um, and so the ambulance came and uh, took the Marine to the hospital. He was in, in, in fair condition. Good, you know, he was okay. It wasn't, it wasn't life-threatening. And the, uh, another ambulance came and got, they, they actually were able to a apprehend the, uh, the robber. And he had broken leg, broken arms, broken ribs, um, uh, contusions, cuts, bruises, teeth knocked out uh, all over him and uh, everything. And um, they, were, they, they took him to the hospital because he had stepped, fallen off the curb. <laughs> Apparently, all the witnesses said he just fell off the curb. <laughs> now, you know, and I know what happened. The other three Semper Fives got in there and put a hurting on him. And then they all just got together and said, he fell off the curb. I didn't do a thing. I don't know what happened to him. <laughs> Hallelujah. <coughs> Let me say something. Jesus has already whooped the devil. But there are a bunch of angels running around. So we're just waiting to enforce the whooping. When principalities, powers, mights, and dominions, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places show up, and you speak the name of Jesus, they are simplified from heaven. We're standing right there with you. There'll be reports going back that the devil's demons fell off the curb. Hallelujah. Can somebody say amen? I said, somebody say amen. You're, you're not fighting this battle in the flesh. You're not fighting this according to natural human ability. There is, a, there is heaven standing behind you, glory to God. It's time you stand up and take your authority over poverty. Take your authority over lack. Take your stand as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, glory to God. And say, no more. And I tried that. Stop trying and do. Amen. Stop trying to figure out what you did wrong and just go do it. Heaven's behind you. Your dad Hagen said something real interesting. Are you ready for this? He said after the Lord revealed something, he said he never prayed for finances again. How many spend time interceding over your finances? He said, I just, I learned just to command the angels to go get my money and bring it in. He said, I just said that when money wasn't coming, he said, I command the angels to go get it and bring it in in Jesus' name. <clears throat> now, if you're praying like this, oh God, we're going under, send us some money. <laughs> listen now, listen, I'm, not, I'm not making fun of you, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to locate you. <laughs> If you're struggling there and that's where you are, stop it. You're not going to get it that way. That's not going to win the battle that way. You stand up and say, I'm a tither and I'm a giver. And I, I, Lord, I thank you because I'm a tither and a giver. And the blessings of God are on me. Angels of God, go get my money and bring it to me in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And stand your ground. <laughs> I said, stand your ground. Yeah. Amen. So Paul says, well, the, the battle's not against fleshly or carnal things. Ever say, I'm not fighting fleshly or carnal things. My weapons aren't carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Let me, let me stop there. You know, a number of years ago, we had a we had a guest speaker at our church I'm out of, uh, C.M. Ward. Anybody ever heard of C.M. Ward? C.M. Ward uh, uh, was assemblies of God his whole life. Um, had a, had a, a, a program called, um, oh man, I, I forgot the name of it, but it's Evangeline or Evangeline or something. I forgot, I forgot the name of his program, but it was long-term running. He was, on, he was on TBM one night and uh, they were interviewing him and he, he just stops and goes, nope. <laughs> He got to know where he was sitting in the chair all the time. He kind of talked, he talked like, he talk like that. He said, you know, the symbols of God must be on the pill. And the host goes, well, Dr. Ward, what are you talking about? He said, because they haven't given birth to anything in years. 
We have in our church not long after that. And so we're sitting in the back room, you know, uh, uh, myself, well, my pastor and the staff, which was included me and some other ministers. And so somebody got the courage up to ask him about that. Yeah. He said, yeah. He said, that's not the end of the story. He said, uh, Springfield called him in. That's where the headquarters is. And they sat him down. They said, Dr. Ward, we heard that you said that the, uh, we must be on the pill because we haven't given birth to anything for years. And he sat there in the chair and he looked, all, he looked at him and went, ha! It's amazing what a man will say under the anointing. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? He's like one of the <coughs> founding type parts of the, the assemblies of God. He, I mean, if, if, they, if they excommunicated him, they lose 90% of the churches. You know? So what do you do with the old, the old guys like that? You just let them run. Hope they don't, you know, just let's let them go. Kind of like Brother Summerall. He came out of one of the meetings so mad because they had $167 million sitting in their missions account. And he's like, he was furious. He said, give that to me. I'll go get something done with it. <laughs> he, he was mad because they just let it sit there instead of using it. He was ready to go do something with it. Hallelujah. What are you going to do, Brother Summerall? Not much. All right. Where was I? Anybody know where I was? Huh? Weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but probably to God, pulling down strongholds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Dr. Ward. That's, that's, that's how I got off of this. Dr. Ward, you know, uh, had, had come to our church and, and the, uh, one of the other staff members went to pick him up from the airport and bring him to the church. And they're riding down the road. He saw a lake. And he turned to the guy and said, you know, Donald G. Now, Donald G. was a very, very prominent leader in the Assemblies of God. He said, Donald G. loved to swim. He said, everywhere he went, he carried a pair of swim trunks. There were even times that he was late for church service because he'd be riding by a lake and stop and get out and go swimming. And of course the guy sitting in the car thinking, what in the world is this all about? And he just, and actually says all this, stops, waits a few minutes and he stops and he looks, he, he, while the guy's driving, he looks over and goes, every man has his vice. See, what may be difficult for, for Greg wouldn't bother Mark at all. But then you can turn around and around with what, what, what bothers Dick. Does it even affect uh, William? And you might look at somebody else and go, how in the world could they give into that? And they're looking at you and thinking, how could you give into that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Mighty through God to the pulling down strongholds. There are areas that Satan attacks our lives in. Yeah, yeah. And it may be different for Benny than it is for Bill. Right. But it's still the same forces behind it trying to drive someone into an area, <coughs> as Dr. Ward said, your vice. But you don't, and listen, and no matter what it is, the weapon is the same. Yeah. They're spiritual weapons. They're not carnal weapons. Amen. And you have to battle them in the spirit and not in the flesh. Yeah. Are you here? You're gone home. Some of you may think, I don't have a problem with gluttony. Okay, maybe you got a problem with sleep. Uh oh. You know? Uh -oh. You sleep 16 and are awake 8. Mm -hmm. Hello? Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with eating too much food. Yeah, but you drink four, two liters a day of Coke. Are y'all here? See, there are, there are things that Satan tries to set up as strongholds in your life that he wants to work against. You can also look at him kind of like as a vice. Something that's a constant, where Satan's constantly coming back in that same area, trying to hit you on, trying to hit you on, trying to hit you on, trying to hit you on. That doesn't mean that you're not spiritual. It doesn't mean you don't love the Lord. But you've got to learn to battle that the right way. And don't listen to these idiots who come along with generational curses. Oh, God. My grandfather was a drunk. My daddy was a drunk. My four brothers are drunk. Guess I am a drunk. <laughs> people teach that stuff and they, they teach people right into bondage. But you know the things you deal with. You know the areas that keep popping back up. Are you here? Learn to deal with them from the Word and not from the flesh. 
And don't look at somebody else who doesn't deal with that and get frustrated that you do and they don't. Because you don't know what they deal with. Think about the man who's one of the, one, one of the greatest preachers of the early, early 20th century. Getting late for church because he's out swimming. He loved to swim so much he just carried his swim trunks. While he's riding down the road, see a pond or a lake. Hop out and go swimming. Now that's a vice. You're going to be late for church to preach because you're swimming. That's better than being late for church because you was with women. But there's still strongholds out there. And the weapons of our warfare, warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to pull in those down. We need to learn that we're, that we're wrestling against spiritual things. There are spiritual battles out there. God's grace is upon us to do the right things, but the might of God. We've got to learn to trust in the might of God. I and mean, he gets ready to tell us what to do here. We're not going to finish it today, obviously. But we've got to understand that when we come against these things, these are not carnal, fleshly things. They may be manifest as things we deal with in the flesh, but to defeat them is going to be in the spirit. If that makes sense. You're not going to defeat them in the flesh. See, this is, why I don't, this is what I don't like about um, some of the um, dependency programs. You know, you get up every day and say, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm this, I'm, an, I'm, I'm a drug addict, or I'm an alcoholic, or I'm, I'm, I'm a pedophile, or I'm a whatever. And you say it over and over now. Listen, I understand realization of things you're dealing with is the first step to freedom. But once you realize what you're dealing with, you don't confess I'm a drug addict or I'm an alcoholic every day of your life. That's just, that's not even, that's nonsensical. I'm free. The Word of God set me free. I know the truth, and the truth has set me free. Amen. To whom the Son has set free is free indeed. I thank God alcohol doesn't lord over me anymore. I don't yield my member as a servant to alcohol. I'm free from alcohol because Jesus has set me free. But I don't get up there and go, I'm an alcoholic. I mean, it's like, I'm a pedophile. I'm a, I'm, I'm a pornographer. I'm this. I'm that. That's stupid. <clears throat> I'm an adulterer. <clears throat> Why? Because you keep building that image and you go out and do it. Now, you, I understand. I understand. On the, on the flip side of this, most alcoholics will never admit they're an alcoholic. And you got to get into admit it before they can get help. Fine. But once you admit that and you get the help, stop saying that's what you are. You're not in denial. You're free from it. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're dealing not with flesh and blood, but principalities, powers, mights, dominions, rulers of the darkness, this world, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So Paul says, wherefore? Well, like one guy says, either when wherefore or therefore is there. See what, why it's there or where it's for. What, what, where it's for there. What, why is it there? Take unto you. Because, because our battle, because our battle is not against flesh and blood. Because our battle is spiritual. Because our battle is not of this world. It's not earthly. Take unto you the whole. Everybody say whole. Whole. Say it again. Whole armor of God. What's that mean? You can't run around and say grace is everything. You can't run around and say faith is everything. You can't run around and say uh, I'm born again is everything. You got to take the whole armor of God. You got to take every bit of the equipment, every bit of the equipping, and stand in it. Amen. It's not limited to one aspect. You send a soldier in the battle with only one part of his armor, and he's ill-equipped for the battle. Take unto you the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now, I like Weymouth's translation of that. Can we get Weymouth up there? Hallelujah. New Testament, modern speech, Weymouth. Weymouth says, uh, are y'all finding it? Okay. He says something like this, and having, having fought to the end, remain victors on the field. See, when you get the whole armor of God, and you're equipped in the whole armor of God, and, okay, here we go. Uh, put on the whole complete armor of God that you may be able to stand your ground on the day of battle, and having fought to the end to remain victors on the field. I like that. 
We fought it. We fought it. We fought it. And when the battle's over, I'm standing victorious on the field of battle. One translation said, said this, and having fought the battle to the end, remaining on the battlefield ready to do battle again. Yeah. I like that. Hallelujah. Amen. See, when you understand the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Listen, that is, a, that is a endless, an infinite stream of authority and power and might. And you can fight the battle and fight the battle and fight the battle. And it looks like you're going to lose, but you win. And guess what? You're ready to go all over again. You're, I mean, you just stay caught, locked, and ready to rock. Yeah. Amen. I said, amen. amen. So Paul says here, he says, put on the what? The whole armor. This it takes part of it. Don't pick the part you think is easy, the part you like, the part you think um, is easy to work with. Put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. It's not just enough to have the truth. It's not just enough to have the righteousness. Mm -hmm. It's not just enough to have faith. It's not just enough to have peace. It's not just enough to have the two-edged sword. It's not just enough to have the helmet of salvation. He said, take the whole armor of God. <clears throat> that you may be able to stand. This tells me that the complete armor is what I need to be equipped to win. Christians all the time running around. Picking up a little, little hot doctrine here, or a hot doctrine there, or a tidbit here and a tidbit there, <clears throat> and running off the deep end with it and saying, that's all I need. And then Paul said, take the whole armor. You need the whole counsel of the Word of God working in your life. Don't limit yourself. You know, you get people, I'm under grace, I don't have to go to church. Yet yeah, the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some. And why is that? Iron sharpens iron. Where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst of them. A threefold cord is not easily broken. There is strength, there's supernatural strength in unity. So you may think because you're under grace, you don't need to be in church. You don't, you know, I don't have to go to church. Well, you don't have to do anything. You're dumb if you don't, but you don't have to. You're stupid on steroids. I don't have to give. I don't have to tithe. I don't have to go to church. Well, no one said, listen, it's not a matter, a matter of you having to. Going to church isn't going to make you righteous. Right. Hello. Obeying is not going to make you um, Kenneth Copeland next week. But all these things should be the fruit and the aspects of our life that are birthed out of a life that's lived under the empowering grace of God, under good works, <clears throat> and the recognition that the body, we be many are one body, that the whole body fitly joined together by that which every joint supplieth, your supply Listen, understand this. Although you're supplying, you're also receiving. I don't have parts of my body that simply supply and never receive back. Other organs in the body supply it so that it supplies. The heart pumps the blood, supplies blood to the whole body. But the lungs supply the oxygen for the blood. You understand? Every part of the body supplies others so that each one can fulfill its purpose of supply. You cannot function effectively or properly outside by yourself going, I don't have to go to church. Pinhead? That's just dumb thinking. So you need the whole counsel of the Word of God. You need the whole armor of the Word of God. Why? Because there's a devil out there. There are forces arrayed against the body of Christ wanting to take it down. And the church needs all the supply of everyone to be joined together in harmony and unity, in the unity of the faith, to get the job done. You're needed. And you need us. We need you, you need us. The heart, listen, the most important part is the heart. 
Got to have the heart. I'm going to tell you something. Without a body, the heart don't have a whole lot to do. That heart can pump blood out in the street all day long and it's not going to help anything. As a matter of fact, the heart will stop working. <coughs> because the electro impulses that the brain provides through the neurological system is what keeps the heart working. Do you understand that the, as the human body is a um, dependent entity, it dep everything about the body, it depends on something else in the body. So is the body of Christ. You don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together because there are things you need from the body. And grace doesn't supply it. Grace doesn't supply you with what Ben has. Grace doesn't make up the difference of what Jerry has. The body together supplieth. Now you may see each part as, a, as grace, but you still got to have them all together for it to work. People say, I don't, need, I don't have to go to church. Come on, people. We need each other. We need the whole armor of God. We need the whole counsel of God. We function together. And the body of Christ needs to get, get a hold of that. And we need to get over that uh, you're only coming to church because it's all about me. I'd like people to start coming to church because, because you're coming to supply. And while you're supplying, God will supply you. Amen? I said amen? What, what am I going to get? Someone one time asked an organization that I, I know about, they said, they said well, well, why don't you come to the, to the meetings? They said, well, what am I going to get? They said, well, what about, how much can, what, what about, let's look at it instead of what, what are you going to get? What can you bring? In other words, what am I going to get supplied with? And the question should be, what can I supply? I know we're talking about the whole council of God. I kind of went off a little rabbit trail there. Maybe big game trail. How do you took an elephant gun out there? It's important that we learn that we have to supply. Then we need the whole council. We need the whole armor. We don't need bits and pieces. We need the whole thing. Thank God for revelation on the grace of God. But I also thank God for revelation on the faith of God. And I thank God for revelation on the peace of God. And I thank God for revelation on the blood of Jesus. And I thank God for revelation. Are you, are you getting this? On how to live upright before the Lord. There's all kinds of things the Bible teaches. I thank God for all that. All of it works together. Thank God for virtue. For brotherly kindness. For meekness. Y'all hear you go home yet? All those are aspects that we need the wholeness of. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Okay. So next week, we're actually going to pick up on the different parts of the armor. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Can somebody say amen? Tonight. What's tonight? <coughs> Communion healing service. Praise God. Hallelujah. We'll be teaching either on the blood of Jesus, healing both, receiving communion, praying for the sick. Amen. You know the sick folk, bring them. You got people you, need, you don't pray for, bring, 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 uh, bring uh, handkerchiefs. We'll pray over those. Okay? That's what's going on. So this first Sunday of the month. Everybody say first Sunday of the month. First Sunday of the month. Communion prayer healing service. Prayer, Holy Ghost, blood of Jesus service. Amen. Amen. Stand up. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of God. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blessings of the Lord. And we just confer those blessings on the congregation now. And thank you that you're teaching us how to live out of the grace of God, do what you commanded us to do with the power of God working in us. We thank you for it in Jesus' name.